Hi, uh, I'm Lena, and I'm from Synergy Physical Therapy Pilates Studio in San Rafael here in California. This week, uh, we were going to talk about, I think we were going to focus on shoulder. So I can maybe just show, I'll share a little bit about shoulder, and then I'll just open it up to you guys to share a little bit more. Um, about your thoughts, and then we'll go through some, we can go through some exercises for that. Um, for my exercises, I feel like um, for the shoulder, I really spend a lot of time working on stabilizing shoulders and reprogramming shoulders. I don't know if it's reprogramming shoulders, but reprogramming movements around the shoulder. So a lot of the exercises that I do typically with clients would be uh, on the Cadillac. I spend a lot of time there. We can mimic quite a few of those with uh, TheraBand too. So we, I can show you some of those and um, just explain why. My experience as a physical therapist has been that most people in the age ranges from, I would say, 45 up tend to start having issues or more and more rotator cuff issues come up. Rotator cuff in the shoulder, for those of you who are really familiar with anatomy, are the four muscles, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. And they basically hold the suction of the shoulder into its socket. So when, over time, with gravity or poor posture, those get stretched out a lot of times, then the mechanic of the shoulder, the movement at the shoulder is not less than ideal, and things can start to go wrong. So sometimes a rotator cuff injury is not because somebody really hurt themselves, but more just sort of a chronic over time issue. So I'm really big on strengthening and stabilizing the shoulder in a way that protects it. And even for people who are not painful at all, protecting that shoulder and then programming it properly when people have all kinds of poor shoulder posture is really a big thing in my life. So my favorite exercises to target are usually serratus press of some kind, uh, and then internal and external rotation of the shoulder. Those for me are kind of key stabilizers. The other piece of that is adding a little bicep work in is always great because the long head of the biceps actually inserts kind of in through that rotator cuff area as well, can really stay, help stabilize the shoulder as well. So I'll take you through my little exercise, those little exercises, and then I'll open up the floor, and then I can explain more about what I would use the Cadillac for potentially for shoulder if you want. Um, so if you have a TheraBand, a little more challenging to, to do it um, when you don't have anything to attach the band to, but you could potentially attach your band in, a lot of times we tell our clients to tie a knot in the end of the band and then put it in the hinge side of the door and shut the door on it. So that's one way to use a TheraBand. The other way, I come up with all kinds of ways to do it with my own body because I'm trying to get everybody to work their rotator cuffs. I'll show you how you do that with your own body. Uh, for external rotation, it's a little easier. I can take the band and I can hold one hand out to the side. And so I'm now going to work my right hand bringing the elbow at my side, shoulder back, and I move into external rotation and back in. So classically, I work, to keep the shoulder safer, I tend to work in a shortened range of motion. So I go from belly to width of my body and back again, rather than going, you could go um, here and going outward, and we have this in the Pilates repertoire, Lacroix on the reformer seated long box does rotation outside of the width of the body. If it's a healthy shoulder, there's no reason why you can't do that. But for a shoulder, if you have any concern about it, I tend to keep it within the width of the body with the shoulder rotation, external rotation. So you could do it just by holding the band out. You could do it by stepping on a band over here and then rotating. It's a little less direct, or maybe over your knee and then you get that same um, rotation without having to hold it with the other hand out there. Right? So that would be external rotation on this side. Then the other direction is the internal rotation. So that takes a little more, and then I switch legs actually, and bring this leg out here, and now I can work, 
Again, the C range for the shoulder is from side body in across to the belly for internal rotation. This is how I've been having my mat classes get to internal rotation with the TheraBand. So one key thing about these rotation exercises is if you really want to isolate rotation, it helps to think about squeezing the elbow into the side body. Then I get a more pure rotation in both directions, so whether it's internal or external. I keep that same cueing most of the time. Um, if, if it's somebody that has a really defined cut in waist or um, can't really keep it at their side, you could put a towel that can is actually putting a towel between her elbow and her side, and that way it will help also give feedback so that you can really hold there and isolate that rotation. Again, the shoulder should stay back, not roll forward with the arm, right? So keeping it open and back is really uh, key for that too. So that's internal external rotation. Bicep curl, I either you can do it kneeling, you can do it standing, but I just come and stand put the weight of the foot on the band, and then curl up here. So again, it doesn't have to be a super full range. I'm trying to get up to my shoulders in this range here. Now we could, if we wanted to isolate long head of the biceps, we could do a pull up from here, but that is really difficult. So I tend to keep it at a bent elbow curl this way, just to keep it a little safer and a little more stable. Right, so that would be bicep curl. So if we went to the other side, we could do this way. So I can go internal rotation here with my left arm as I come in. So again, elbow tight at the side, we'll rotate it in. And so I'm going width of my body into my belly. And then to get external rotation on this side, I just switch legs and opening. And then I can go from my belly opening to external rotation. So again, you could just tie a knot in the band, stick it in the door, and have them doing internal and external rotation. Or I put it sometimes around the Cadillac pole if I'm at the studio and I'm using it. I have something to hook it on. Or onto the springboard. We stick them on the springboard sometimes. Or you could use your springboard. But just to give them a way to do this. So if and if we go to bicep curl, I'm sorry, we did bicep curl. We go to serratus press. Lots of ways to do a serratus press. So with the band, we I go behind the shoulder blades, right? So it's right across my uh, shoulder blade on my back and I collect the band in, I like to collect the band in my hand so I if I know what I'm doing I can do serratus press here where I just punch forward and at the same time let my ribcage push a little bit back into the band and then shoulders come back into their sockets pushing forward letting the ribcage press a little bit backwards and the shoulder blades actually open wide on my back and come forward. I find this is really hard to do if, if to get people to do correctly if they don't already have a good familiarity with the serratus press. So um, this Can might you not. Turn in profile is that possible? Yes, it is very possible. So yeah, this I'm pre pressing the knuckles forward and the ribcage back, and then shoulder blades come uh, away again. So it's almost like I feel the shoulders going in the sockets and then they're pushing away, and then going in the sockets. So but for most, for a lot of people who don't have this awareness, the, my favorite place is actually to do it either laying on the roller or on all fours. And so it's easier to go to all fours, so I'll go there first. If I come down and place my hands on the floor, and Genevieve demonstrated this one in one of our other sessions, but it is one of my favorite because you get this press away from the floor and you can still feel your shoulder blades push into the band on your back and then release down and press away and then release down and press away 
So I'm trying, I, we get a lot of kind of the back moving at first. I try to really, the band there gives them some feedback to find that motion up higher, not have it be in the back, and the low back. That's it. And press away. So the other way to do it that gives them nice feedback too is to have them lay along the roller. And the reason you can do this laying flat on the mat too if you don't have a roller. But the reason I like the roller is because they can really feel that the shoulder blades are doing a lot of the work or doing the movement part of the work. So here I can push up to the sky, and then as I come down, I can actually feel the shoulder blades around the roller, right? So I can push up to the sky, feel the shoulder blades around the roller and press up. So it's not as much work as when I'm on all fours, but it's really good awareness training and kind of training for feedback purposes and that re-educating the muscles what to do. Okay. And then relax. So those would be my, my kind of go-to for exercises if, if I was going to go for shoulder stability. Um, so let me open up to you guys. Do you have any other shoulder favorites, um, either for stability or mobility, whichever just really good shoulder exercise that you guys use? Hey, Zayna. Hey, Allison. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> one thing that I've been doing with some of my clients um, that are working from home online and uh, um, just to, to kind of warm up their shoulders, but also kind of give them something that they can do every day. Um, it's just little shoulder circles. So it's tiny movement, like 10 forward, 10 back, and then make the little, uh, uh, increase it a little bit. You can also do it in different hand positions. So, um, you know, stretching, um, the, the lower side and then also, um, stretching the tops of the hands as they're doing. It's just a tiny movement, but after a while, um, your shoulders really start to burn because you're holding your arms up. So there's weight there. Um, and then it's just sort of, um, I don't know, it sort of lubricates the joint, I think, a little bit. And it's nice because after doing that for a while, their shoulders do get stronger, even though it's a tiny movement and they're really not, it doesn't, feel like work until, you know, they've done like 40 of them and all of a sudden they're like, okay, can we stop now? <laughs> but um, I found that one's a good one um, just to, to get them in their shoulders every day. I wanted to add something for a second. Hi. Um, I was just thinking about, I saw in, um, I think in the Ellie Herman book, she's like standing against the wall, like her feet are box against the wall her feet are like a few inches away from the wall in like a Pilates uh, first position kind of like how we would be on the reformer and then she she kind of does this that same thing her you know the arms are out in front a little bit at like a 45 degree angle and doing like the shoulder circles that way um, and I guess the point is to stabilize you know the, the spine and um, get the pull up in the pelvic floor but then work on that shoulder motion in that position. So just since you were doing arm circles, I was just thinking of that and wanted to add that. So thank you. Hello. Hi, Gloria. I don't, can you hear me? I, this is my first time here, so I'm sorry. Well, welcome. Glad okay. <laughs> it's a shoulder stretch that I learned recently that I love and I think it's uh, very helpful. So what you do is you press your elbow against your side. You flip the hand over where the palm is facing away from you against your back. You lift your shoulder up and then bow so you're flexing the cervical spine and the thoracic spine. You hold that for approximately 30 seconds. Then you ask the client to come up in an upright position. Ask them to flip their hand to touch against their back. And then they hold that for approximately 30 seconds as well. And what happens is when they release, they have to release it very gently and then shake it out. And then what happens, the shoulder drops significantly, which allows for a lot of range of motion. So that's something that I've learned that I've used with my um, clients that's very helpful. 
Great, thank you. That mm -hmm. looks like um, stretching exactly. So hand behind the back, we consider as internal rotation, right at the shoulder. So hand behind the back really stretches open that internal rotation, which is great for people who have gotten really stiff with that. People who have um, also had a frozen shoulder, that's one of the things that they have a hard time regaining is the internal rotation. So um, hand behind the back is a great way to start working on it. Um, and that, that's a really nice way to do it without having to have a lot of props to do it. So thank you. Hey Gloria, I have a quick question on that one. So if they're not as fabulously flexible as you, um, what would be the modification? Okay. So if, pardon me, if they cannot do so, what I always ask of them to do is to keep their elbows as close to your body as possible and they're not as flexible. So what happens is they're not going to be able to bring their hand in between their shoulder blades. Their hand is going to fall down to the side. As long as the elbow is close to their, to their body, that's really the important parts of it. But the hand does not necessarily have to be up here. It can, it's okay if it falls down. And then um, to flex the spine forward and to hold it. And then after that, they stand up straight, then try to bring their hand. And most of the time what happens is this. They can't touch their back, so they're here. But I'll take that as well. Have them hold it for approximately 30 seconds. And then when they release, it truly is a big significant drop in the shoulder. And, and you can try it for yourselves. And um, it's not painful. You know, some people will, just, will say it's uncomfortable because it is, because you're twisting the body in so many different ways, and therefore you're manipulating um, the, the muscles in all directions. And so what happens, it drops down quite significantly, which gives them a lot of range of motion in movement. Allison, you had a question. So I thought while we were on the topic of shoulders, um, we could talk about frozen shoulder a little bit if you have a client who's been diagnosed with frozen shoulder? Um, are there specific exercises that are good for that? Okay, I can pipe in, or does anyone else want to pipe in? First, you just wave if you want to pipe in. I'll start us, and then if you guys have some comments, I'm happy to have you join in. So I, the exercise that I just showed you were stability exercises. So the shoulder is the opposite of stability exercise. Eventually, yes, stability exercise is. It, it, the only diagnosis is frozen shoulder, meaning they don't have a rotator cuff injury, and then they ended up with frozen shoulder. Then there aren't a lot of precautions to worry about for frozen shoulder. So what, but what frozen shoulder is, we don't really know what brings it on for the you are not that familiar. We don't really know. It's an insidious onset of some kind. Sometimes it happens after an injury. Sometimes it happens and there's no really noting, noting of any injury or anything. And it generally hits women between the ages of 40 and 60. So that's, that's sort of the biggest demographic of frozen shoulder. And the real term, the non kind of everybody term of it is adhesive capsulitis. So meaning adhesive, sticky capsule, the shoulder capsule, itis inflammation. So a sticky inflamed capsule of the shoulder is what it actually is. So the capsule of the shoulder, I like to think about every. Um, I like to think about the capsule as the part that sucks the shoulder into its position. So if you think of the anatomy of the shoulder, the clavicle and the acromion of the scapula come in. They form a little triangular joint, and underneath that triangle is the head of the humerus. So it kind of sits under there. Rather than like the hip joint where there's a big old socket and a hip joint in it, the shoulder doesn't have the big old socket. So what actually holds the shoulder in this little tiny socket, and we have a little bit of a, I should say, on the scapula of the glenoid. So we do have a little bit of something that's holding it a tiny bit in here. But um, it's not like a big socket where the head and humerus just fits. So the rotator cuff muscles and the capsule of that shoulder hold it into place. So stick it up into place. So if you now have this capsule that is sticky and inflamed, the symptoms of that are lack of range of motion, right? So the 
they lose range of motion. And if we leave a frozen shoulder alone, after two years, usually a year of immobility and a year of pain, it will get better. It'll just go away. So a lot of times that's the case. And it may go away entirely or may go away partially, but if you left it alone after two years, typically it will just resolve on its own. Um, most people are in too much pain to want to wait two years to go through the whole thing. So it depends on what stage the person that you're working with is in. But really what you're trying to do is not stabilize that shoulder because it's stuck. It's um, more than stable. You're trying to mobilize that shoulder. So the work then re is reverse of what we were just doing for stability. It's mobility. So it's stretching the shoulder in all the positions. So the stretch that Gloria just showed us is a really good one uh, for that, actually. The inch hand behind the back for internal rotation. Um, and the posturing of keeping the elbow at the side actually helps keep the shoulder open rather than rolling forward. So that is actually a very good cue also. But most of them can't get their hand anywhere near up at all. So the way that we add that is um, sometimes I have them take a band and hold on, the drop both of it way down low, and then they can start pulling upward and pick up the arm by pulling upward. So that's one way to get it. And then you can work on rolling that shoulder open or bringing the elbow up the side at the same time. So you could definitely work on internal rotation. That is one of the motions that gets most, um, most notably decreased with a frozen shoulder is internal rotation. The other things you'd really want to work on are um, stretching the capsule of the shoulder. A couple of good ways to do that are um, the easiest way is to take the hand across the front of the body, that elbow in the hand here, and then pressing the elbow towards my chest. And at the same time, I'm trying to sit down the shoulder. So the stretch should be felt kind of in this area here. So that's one way, that's the easy way to get that posterior capsule on a little bit of stretch. People go wrong with them a lot of the time, so they tend to get, let the shoulder up to their chin sometimes. So you want to try and have them settle it down and bring it across. The other way to get that same posterior capsule stretch, which we use a lot in PT, is to have them lay it on that shoulder. So with my right shoulder, I'm trying to stretch. I'll start a little bit on my back, and then I can roll onto the shoulder. And while I'm rolled onto the shoulder, I'm tucking it underneath me on purpose. <clears throat> not, not how I want them to sleep, for sure, but just with this stretch. Then bend the elbow up here. So I'm trying to keep the arm at level with my shoulder as I go, and I'm laying on it. Then I can take my free hand and start to press into a little bit of internal, <laughs> excuse me, internal rotation. And I don't know if you guys noticed, but when I was doing my hand behind my back, it was way up uh, behind my shoulder blades. But in this position, I don't have that much internal rotation, right? Because I, I'm on the capsule. So the idea is not really the internal rotation, it's really to stretch the posterior capsule with the arm going into internal rotation here. So you could you would go to tolerance here. Have them hold for a while. Actually, thirty seconds. I, I have a question and a comment about that. Yes, please. Um, mobilization, and I I don't know how much you'll be able to see what I'm doing, but this is just something I've played with because I have shoulder issues myself, and I I mean if if this is wrong, everybody just disregard what I'm saying. I'm going to ask Zena, but. Sometimes when I'm doing this, I put my fist up close to my armpit and I do the internal rotation with my opposite forearm so that I can get a little bit of mobilization there in a posterior direction. And it feels more effective to me. Yeah. Yeah, I like that too. I really and like I, get, that. I get, with my fist, I get pretty close up to the joint so that my line of force is really directing my humerus back to the back of my body. Yeah. I, Is that I like that sure? Yeah, I like that a lot. In fact, that takes a lot of the torque out of the elbow, I feel like. So sometimes I feel like this gets really irritating on the elbow, but if your pressure's coming in, um, yeah. it may not, yeah. Yeah, thank you. 
And so that, that is a good um, posterior capsule stretch. And then the other thing you'll notice is they really lose a lot of flexion, the shoulder flexion. If you test them on their back, that arm you know, will often be quite different, one side versus the other. So stretching for flexion, like stretching like this on the roller or even on the floor is good. Taking a um, broom or a stick and trying to take, I would use my left arm to take my right arm back to, and put some weight through it. So you can actually really put some weight through the shoulder for the stretch. So I find that that's less effective than actually taking them into kind of this, this shoulder stretch, the last stretch here on the roller. I really like because now I have a lot of control over how much weight I want to put through the shoulder. So this helps me open up a little bit more deeply than if I have it just gravity against gravity. So I try and find ways to stretch the shoulder with a little more pressure than just against gravity if, if they have it available. So the roller, that lap stretch is a nice one too. So I think, um, and, and then I said, like I said, it's about the stage of it too. You aren't gonna cause more damage with the frozen shoulder by stretching them. If, if there's no like rotator cuff that led to the shoulder, if there's a rotator cuff, then you're going to have to watch a rotator cuff tear to me. You're going to have to watch for those precautions while you're stretching the frozen shoulder. But usually that resolves itself before you're dealing with the frozen shoulder. And then you'll have to see how much pain they're in. And typically it will hurt them to stretch, but you're not it's not the kind of pain where you're actually causing damage. So you don't have to be afraid of them stretching into discomfort in this case. Uh, in fact, sometimes they have to stretch into that discomfort to make it change. So giving them tools to do it at home where they can just push themselves over time is really great because they need to get on it and start moving. Yeah, does that help? Thank you. Yeah, that does help. I, the, the thing that I've seen the most, and this is like my the second client I've had with a uh, frozen shoulder lately, is they're, they're lifting their shoulder with the trap and they're guarding everything with the trap. And so anytime I'm trying to move that shoulder for them in any way to stretch it, it's, this is happening constantly. And they're like trying to keep the trap down, but they're just so, because they're in so much pain, that, that guard's coming up. So I think trying to get them to, to keep this down and you know stretching it behind them actually prevents them because the minute she tries to raise her arm this happens yeah. so it's uh yeah it's hard <laughs> and I know she's in a ton of pain because I've been training her for a long time and she's um not one to complain so yeah. thank you yeah of course so the other thing is, is really with the, the frozen shoulder if you have access to all, all your equipment with the person then the Cadillac is a great place, the push-through bar on the Cadillac, the metal bar, because you can do a lot of the exercises, and then it can be a passive lifting up of the arms, right? So say, for example, a cat is on the Cadillac. I'm going to pretend that I have the Cadillac. Sorry, I'm going to show you just now. But um, you can push down, and then the body goes. So as my body goes forward, my shoulder is going into flexion. Right, but it's, it's just automatically going because it's attached to that bar when the bar goes. And the bar has this beautiful arc to it. So I can go forward and I can take it back and I can go down and reaching upward. But again, it's my body. And so there's, a, it makes it a lot easier. And then your hands are actually free to help guide where you want that shoulder to be. Uh, so, so the cat or the pec lat or um, the push through, if their you know back is fine for that, those are all great ways to use that push through bar to help guide the motion. And it seems that when the motion is guided like that, it's less uncomfortable somehow. It just provides that arc, and there's a lot more trust. The other thing I should throw in there is if they're in this really painful stage and they're not able to move, a lot of times if they get it checked out, the doctor will actually give them a steroid injection into the shoulder. And I am not a big, like, give people injections everywhere sort of person, but in the, in the frozen shoulder, 
I've seen it make a huge difference for people. So, you know, getting an injection and then coming back and working on motion makes a huge difference and really helps push the process along. And the research is showing that it's pushing, can cut the time in half of how long this takes to get over. So it may be worth, if you see them in pain, you know them for a long time, you've seen them in so much pain, just saying, hey, this might be one of those things where you really want to go see a doctor about and let them decide if, you know, if you're a good candidate, if there's something that you need to get rid of your pain. You don't even have to say what you're thinking, but just say, you know, I, I think there might be some other ways we can help with the pain so we can actually get moving the shoulder again. So that might be the right kind of um, conversation to have as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Anyone else have anything on frozen shoulder or another question? I guess I can show a couple more exercises that I found that has helped some clients um, real quickly. Is um, I usually have like a chair where they can use a wall where they can place their feet and then use a yoga block. If they don't have a yoga block, a roller, you know, above their shoulder will help. So I basically, this is just to keep them in neutral spine. And then they put the yoga block right above their shoulder the elbows directly in alignment with the shoulder. Their hand is resting on top of the yoga block. I ask them to start with a deep inhalation, and as they exhale, to gently push down about 8% of their body strength against the yoga block, and then release. And then I have them repeat it about, um, in total about 8 to 10 times, which helps pull the trapezius downward, which helps pull the shoulder back. So then they, get, they have range of motion again in their shoulder as well as their neck. And then um, what I have found with frozen shoulder clients is if I have them lay down in the fetal position, I don't know if you can see me. If I have them lay down in a fetal position, their shoulders are stacked on top of each other, hips are stacked, arms are in front. Now, breathing helps immensely because it calms down the nerves. So when they take a deep breath in, when they exhale, the whole entire arm has to be completely loose, and then they start to rotate only the upper body and stop where, it's, where, where they can't go any further. Take a deep breath in, and then exhale to return. And the more, the more that that happens, it starts to break up the fascia, which releases the muscle, which releases the bones, and then they're able to open up to a full T. So you do that a number of times until the, until the body opens up, and again, they have a lot of relief in their in their shoulders. So sort of the combination of the three that I showed you is what I provide for them. And they always feel super loose. And it doesn't really matter what age they are. Great. Yeah, so the so they inhale to start at the stopping point at the stopping point, exhale for the movement, and then once they can't go any further, just stop, take a deep breath in and then exhale to return. And they keep doing that, and the more that, that they keep doing it, the more their body is allowed to open up. I have um, something which is super simple, which I, I think a lot of us know, TheraBand and the formal or things that we can do, so I won't go there, but one of the things that I like to do with people who have the overact overactive trap, um, and have this situation going on a lot is to give them as a home exercise, just a shoulder blade pinch. So I ask people to do this where, and I have this top one, but right, just taking the shoulder blades together and down and holding for about five seconds at a time. And I ask people to do that in sets of maybe 10 and to do it throughout the day to sort of reprogram where are they and what are they doing and to one thing to get an awareness here, but also to develop the strength in the middle and lower trapezius so that the shoulder blade can stay more seated on the back and we can counteract the, the writing up that so many of us do when we're driving or talking on the phone or getting stressed out or any of those things. So I ask people to do this when they are pumping gas or waiting for the kettle to boil or any of those things because it doesn't require any equipment. And it's helpful, like I said, both for strength, but also what we call um, sort of neuromuscular nerve muscle 
programming. So super, super easy, but I think effective in the long term. Yeah, I would just build on that, Frida, thank you. I would just build on what, what Frida did when she went back, is if you looked at what her hands were doing, they're rotating palms forward a little bit. So that is, um, sometimes I'll use that, even keeping the hands at the side, rotating palms forward really helps open the front of the shoulder. So I can just stay here, rotate palms forward and get the shoulders, the front of the shoulders to open. And a lot of times, a lot of these issues come into the shoulders because of a forward shoulder posture. So if all they did was rotate palms forward, they're already in a better place. And then what Frida was doing was activating the shoulder blades on top of that, which is even better. So, but it's a great trick to use even like seated on the long box, pulling the ropes. I'll sometimes have people just keep going forward, right, with their shoulders when they pull the ropes. So sometimes I'll just have them pull a little bit with a light weight and then tell them to rotate the palms forward when they get there. And then keep the shoulders where they land, rotate the palms back to neutral, and then go forward with it, and then pull back again, rotate those palms to activate the back body and open the front of the shoulder. Keep the shoulder there, rotate the palms back, and go forward. So that's just a great little trick that um, Frida was doing without telling me, so I thought I would tell you <laughs> that she's doing it. Yeah, anyone else? Feel free to jump in. Are any other questions about shoulders? Okay, so I'll add on, feel free to just jump in anytime. I'll add on to where I was going with stability. So, and I'm still addressing a little bit that frozen shoulder. After we get that movement, we have to maintain range of motion, and we have to strengthen in the range of motion, and we have to strengthen that shoulder again. So it's been through something terrible when it's been through any injury, including frozen shoulder or that. One of my favorite ways to stabilize after, again, other than the rotator cuff, um, is rowing, back rowing to get that back body open, uh, strong and holding the trunk up, right, and, and fixing posture, and planking, which is um, always great for approximation of the shoulder into the joint. So the exercises that most of my clients come out with after a shoulder injury are the rotator cuff, then straight arm and bent arm rowing. So I found it, again, a little more challenging now that we're trying to do everything virtually, but the same rule would apply with your band. You could tie the knot, put it in the door, or I can put you in some funky postures and get it out of you. So in my classes, I've been having people come into a half meal or a lunge. I actually like the position in the lunge a little bit better, but then you have all the complications of having to deal with somebody lunging, which you may or may not want to deal with. So uh, I'll show it to you here on, on the knee so that we don't have to talk about all those details. But strain arm row uh, is basically the chest expansion exercise. So I'm just pulling back, but I'm trying to get back far enough that my hands pass my side body a little bit so that I can activate my shoulder blades. So back here, I feel like I can activate the shoulder blades, squeeze, and slowly release forward. And my cue here is always to dig the knuckles into the floor. So dig your knuckles into the floor, stretch the head long, pull the arms back past the body, let the shoulders wrap downward, and then slowly release. Great. So exhaling, pulling, shoulders down, reaching back, and slowly release. So that would be the straight arm row. The bent arm row, I take up a little more slack and I'm pulling the elbows back and slowly release. So the idea of this one is really to get the shoulder blades on again. And I have to say, this isn't my favorite angle for the exercise. My favorite angle is actually to have the band above me uh, and pulling because here the tendency is to lift up Whereas if the band is above me, so the best I can do on the mat here is to come onto my back here. So if I'm pulling here, then I actually create a more of a downward motion. I'm less likely to climb up my shoulders. 
So we do it at the studio. Um, the, the Cadillac will actually on the springboard with the hinge back because then I feel like I can active, activate the lower trapezius muscles more. And as I'm pulling backward, I'm less inclined to roll the shoulders forward and lift them up. So it's a couple ways to get to the rowing. Or again, you could have it attached into um, the door and then your line of pull would be uh, this way, pulling this way. Yeah. So rowing straight arms, rowing bent arms, just to activate the upper back. And then planks. So planks can be anything from all fours to half plank to full plank. And you can start working again with the serratus press like we did, or you can start working into just holding that full plank either way. But the idea is that here I start getting some weight through the shoulder, but in a really good posture and alignment. So you're really concerned that the posture and alignment is correct. And then the other way for my really athletic people, I actually have them start lifting up to put weight going down through the shoulder. So this way, I really put that shoulder into position here. So I wouldn't go to like a full, full vertical position, but just a part way up. This way, I'm weighing through those arms. I feel like my shoulders can sit in their sockets and just approximate back into position. So you want to think shoulder in socket, shoulder position, right? And if you're in downward up, I'd just be careful if it's really back here, then my shoulders and elbows might go out to the side. So you want to make sure that the elbows and shoulders are wrapped in when you have the weight. And it's more about putting the weight on the hands than pushing backward. Pushing backward can actually rotate mm -hmm. them out instead of keep them up over you. So really trying to keep that weight down through the line of the shoulder. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. I think it's related in terms of the angles of the shoulder. Um, what is your opinion, Zaina, on the, the push-ups from the knee? For people who want to do push-ups, the, the value or the danger of doing pu knee push-ups from the knees versus doing an elevated push-up. So push-up with a completely straight body, but like on a countertop or on a bench or something like that. Correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, but I'm thinking, for me, um, here, there's just more weight here if I'm on my knees. If I bring my hands up against a wall, there's a lot less weight. So there's there's that aspect of it. And then the other aspect of it is where the elbows end up going. So I really feel like um, I've battled with push-ups for a long time, going through gymnastics as a kid and um, circus and then landing as a PT. But I feel like my best, the best alignment in a push-up is actually when your elbows are coming down towards your side. So I really, um, the wide elbow push-ups are not horrible, but um, they do, do some strange things to your wrists. And I don't feel like they're as supportive. Of, the whole body is not as supported as it is when the elbows are coming in forward to the sides if you're in a good push-up. So something worth playing with and see what you feel. Like, so, and I'm really, I'm really, what I don't like about push-ups is that um, this chest drop business that happens in people losing control over their shoulder blades when they're going into a push-up. So I'd much rather support people in a place where they can stay, you know, that serratus press action has to be there the whole time. So even a serratus press, I have to bend the elbows, keeping that, that lift in my shoulders. I can't push up and be in this position here and then kind of work my way. This is terrible for my shoulders now, right? So if that's what you're seeing, then you do, do absolutely need to get them up right to a wall, you know, where they can have their feet out in decent form with that push up and maintain that serratus press away while they're bending elbows. Do you so think that there's any, um risk or danger in doing that push-up from the knees in terms of the angles that occur at the shoulder? Or do you think it, as long as the elbows are in and the serratus is active, that it's safe? I think it's pretty safe. The people that I would worry about are people with a major shoulder instability. So I probably wouldn't start there with somebody with that instability. 
I think you're, are you thinking of exposing the front of the shoulder and not having enough anterior stability with, or like an anterior tear or something? It, I'm not sure exactly what, what it would look like in terms of the direction and the force. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not, I don't know, I don't actually know, but I've just had some people warn me against doing that. That if people aren't strong enough to do a full regular push up, to instead have them do an elevated push up as opposed to the push ups from the knees. Right. Um, and when you're saying a full regular push up, you mean like on toes and, and all the way straight? Yeah, well, you have the extended knees. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I think you have. I think you should be careful with push-ups, um, in general, even from the feet or from the knees, if they're not strong enough. I think if they're strong enough from the knee, I don't think. They, I think that they can do it, but it is more di much more difficult. Even um, I don't know if it's so much the angle as it is the um, amount of weight to push back, and then not being able to maintain the right posture so now this is putting me at risk whereas if i can maintain this and keep it in um i think it's okay but it is a harder position much harder so you are protecting somebody by bringing their hands up higher and having them bend here. even sometimes i i'm not really strong enough to do a full push-up so i will do um I'll put my hands on something that's maybe two feet tall off the ground and yeah. do a push up there. Yeah. So it takes taking a lot of weight off and it's giving you a little bit different angle. I mean, even if you want to try here without having that middle, even putting your hands on the roller makes a difference as to where, how much I can bend and press with a little effort. So as soon as you start bringing the arms up higher and higher, it makes the, the support easier weight-wise and angle-wise. As the arms go further away like they do on the wall here, they are higher, whereas higher, so when I bend, my shoulder, anterior shoulder is not so far over my hands. When my hands are underneath me here and I bend down, my shoulders pass my hands, right? Whereas if I'm up on the wall with my hands further out, my, my shoulders don't pass my hands. So it is a lot, a lot more work kind of think of it kind of exponentially harder on the mat than against the wall for all those reasons. So you've got to have some, that's why I actually often, if I'm teaching push-ups, I'm usually telling people I prefer them to be on their knees and I'm really working on that serratus and telling them to do baby bends. Whereas I'll do planks with everybody because holding that plank is a lot easier and safer, just practicing really holding the plank. And in my beginning classes, we don't do push-ups at all. We just hold plank and do practice serratus pressing the floor away. So um, keep, keep in mind there's a huge difference between a plank and a push-up and that you must have good form. And if you can't get it on the floor, the wall is definitely better or up on a higher surface is definitely better. Yeah. Is there, a, just a quick question, is there with those push-ups, um, a lot of times, I guess, for classes, I'm trying to cue, like, how many to do. Like, is there kind of, like, I don't know, for kind of an intermediate class, maybe try to do 15 or 10 or, um, I don't know, just something like that? That's a good question. I mean, I don't ever ask them to do more than 10 push-ups. Mm -hmm. I just ask them to have better and better form or to make the push-up more difficult. So to go from a kneeling to a... Uh, straight leg or to go from a small push-up to a full push-up down and up mm -hmm. uh, in good form. So even my strongest men in the classes, um, I've had maybe one or two that could do 10 really good all the way down to chest and back up full push-ups ever. So that remains a good challenge, I think. So I don't think you have to go more than 10. But I think most of the time you should just have them and do little baby bends, trying to keep the radius on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, great. Anything else? That time is flying by. Anyone have a good last question for us about shoulder or comment? Go, Genevieve. So actually, um, it's a push-up question. Um, and 
It's it's something where I, I think it was a yoga class a while ago that I took. <clears throat> I had um, an instructor who said that doing your push up. Sorry, let me doing your push up um, with the hands more under the shoulders um, or in front. I think they said that it was um, loading the joints more versus taking your weight a little forward and doing your push up there. Um, I recognize it as like shifting the weight forward is definitely more challenging. Um, as you mentioned, it's like more of your weight over your hands that you're trying to move. Um, and I just was wondering if there was any credence to that, like sitting in your joints comment. I don't really know. And um, I think that's sort of what Krita is getting at. Where is the force line of force when we're doing a push up? Um, I don't know exactly what's happening. What in my mind's picture, which could be wrong, but as soon as you start coming more and more forward, you're just making a, there's less structural support, I think. Um, in the front of the shoulder is what I feel like. That just makes the shoulder more vulnerable the more forward you go. So does that make it less in the joint and more muscular? Potentially. But I think what our best bet would be to look at, what I should do is go look and see, watch the mechanic. I'm sure somebody, I'm sure out there there's an x-ray up or a, like a motion screen of somebody doing a push-up and look at where the shoulder joint actually sits when they're doing it. Um, that would be really cool. Maybe I'll try and find that and share it with you guys. But just to see how much force is coming into the joint versus muscular force and how exposed. I worry about um, exposing the front of the shoulder and not being able to control it and not going into something not healthy. So, yeah. And one other question or one other thing that we didn't quite get to today and probably don't have time to, but. Um, I was curious about like finding people finding their side plank um, shoulder because a lot of people tend to have this like rolling forward and they can't quite find that um, situated back position. Um, so I don't know, maybe we can talk about that and like that whole structure another time. Yeah, I can throw in really quick. I mean, I, for me, that's more scapular stability than it is shoulder. So um, what you did was put your self, you grab under here, what, that's exactly what I do. I grab under there and I pull the scapula downward in order to create that stability. So the feeling, and, and I let people get higher here to feel that before settling in lower. Lower, I feel like the scapula wants to slide up and then I end up with all this pressure in my shoulder joint. Whereas if I really pick up into that, I can pull the arm essentially towards my hip, and then I get a really nice contraction in the underside of the body to really create that scapular stability. Mm. Yeah, I, I was um, thinking about like the ball as a prop to kind of encourage lifting up through there, like trying to not squash the ball or something. If that, yeah, I think that's headed in the right direction. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And then just to add on to that, and so doing that um, side plank on the elbow, I'm always, I guess I cue people not to like be right on their elbow. They kind of want to do the whole like forearm there or even maybe a, like a little bit forward because I think it tends to maybe push people a little bit forward. But I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? If, if I'm not trying to understand the question yet, if, you're asking, should they be back on the elbow or more forward on the um, Well, so I notice sometimes if maybe someone's like not very strong or something, they kind of want to like put the weight into their elbow a little bit. And I try to encourage them to be a little bit more forward with the fingers facing forward or sometimes even with the elbow facing or just a little bit more at like a 45 degree angle to get that space. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? I agree with you. And then again, I come back to this hand grabbing my shoulder blade, pulling it down. It actually pulls my trunk here a little bit rotating to put myself over the shoulder better. Mm -hmm. Pull that 
so that I'm not pulling it up to the sky, I'm just pulling it horizontal. So that helps me keep my weight spread more. Yeah, and I guess it would be more into the, the obliques where we're trying to get the, um, to the strength and support happen anyway as well. Yeah, uh, I'll just add one more thing to the, the side plank. Um, so another cue, and I, I noticed this, like if we've been here a while doing um, exercises, I'll see um, people start to kind of slouch a little here. So the same cue that I believe it was, uh, I can't remember who, who cued the um, squeeze the shoulder blades together earlier. That's, uh, yes, okay, so that same cue works here as well. So if you cue, like, like try to squeeze your shoulder blades together and pull them down, it lifts them out and gets them back in the proper position to be um, in sideline. Um, actually, and that being said about that, where should the knees be in relationship when you're up, like the knees at your hand for good alignment there? And like, or the butt at your back of your shoulder? To try and keep the body in one straight line. Yes. So, shoulder, hip, knee. Hopefully. Hopefully something like that. <laughs> Yes, and then wrapping here, you can squeeze the shoulder blades on and get that nice position. Yeah. Great, you guys. Um, so for just just to wrap up for one minute, note, note that in the shoulder, we really have three joints, right? And three different areas to talk about. We have that scapula, and that uh, we call it scapula thoracic rhythm. We have the glenohumeral, which is the shoulder itself, and then we have the chromioclavicular joint. So we have a lot going on at the shoulder. So we can definitely revisit and talk about it again. Um, if you want, we can continue next week talking more about scapular stability, if you would like, or we can move on to a different topic. If you, guys, if you want to keep going scapular stability, can you wave at me? And then... Yeah. Okay, so let's maybe just do that. Let's work on scapular stability next week so we can keep this conversation going. And then think about things this week that really um, trouble you about scapular stability. And any other questions that come up about the shoulder, we can address those. And then uh, we'll go from there. We'll move on from there to a different body part. Great. Thank you guys so much for being here. It's great to have you all.